The story of Brooks began long before there existed a field where young men learned to fly. The story, like so many others in history, originated with the source for all life on our planet, water. The San Antonio River first attracted the beasts of the field, then native peoples. The flow of civilization to what would become San Antonio followed the river. Well, first and foremost is water. The San Antonio River, which starts at the headwaters of the San Antonio River on the Incarnate Word College campus, just a little bit north of Hildebrand, and everything flowing south where the missions were established were a uh, huge, like the oasis in the desert, a huge asset. And, you know, if you have water, uh, you can have life. The Spanish colonial period brought the first wave of immigration to Texas. Four of the five missions in San Antonio were built along the river. The missions framed an area that not only became a major settlement site, but later the center of military aviation and the wonders of innovation that followed. Water plays a key area to this settlement. And so San Antonio becomes uh, a trading place and a stopping place between the Rio Grande, those missions there, and East Texas. And so San Antonio does become a key role in the settlement of Texas. The river was more than a source that sustained life and encouraged human development. The river also became the lifeblood for subsequent waves of immigration that occurred during the 19th century. Communities that grew along its banks included German immigrants who claimed and worked the land on which Brooks Field would later be built. The community of Berg's Mill in particular played a pivotal role in the creation and early development of Brooks Field. Located on the western boundary of the area that became a primary flying training base, Berg's Mill was populated by native peoples and European immigrants. Berg's Mill was also home to Rudolph and Eliza Keilman, Prussian immigrants who built the family homestead where the Dairy Queen on Southeast Military Drive is now located. It became a more than 3,000 acre spread that began at the San Antonio River and covered most of present day Brooks. The Keilman's estate would one day become an important Army and later Air Force aviation center. Ultimately, their land would become a special place that evolved into one of the world's greatest centers for aerospace and space medicine research. In San Antonio's King William District at 155 Crofton Avenue, another family would play a pivotal role in the story of Brooks. Sidney Johnson Brooks Jr., for whom Brooks Field would later be named, was the 22-year-old son of Judge Sidney Brooks Sr. and the former Clara Swearingen. World events, however, interrupted the career of this former San Antonio Light newspaper reporter who abruptly ended his law studies at the University of Texas. He instead answered our nation's call to arms when America entered World War I after having declared war on Germany. Sidney Brooks was among many San Antonio native sons who joined the Army in 1917. He was assigned to Camp Funston, an officer's training camp located north of San Antonio in the community of Leon Springs. It was there where he volunteered for military aviation training. <music> Sidney Brooks, 
Standing on family honor, Sidney Brooks's commitment to Army aviation training did not waver, despite conflict in his personal and professional life. He was a young man torn between the love for his country and the love of a woman he had met while working as a reporter. He found his soulmate in Lottie Jean Steele, a debutante who lived in San Antonio's upscale Terrell Hills neighborhood. She was the daughter of the San Antonio Light Circulation Manager. Lottie had already completed finishing school and had been introduced to San Antonio society when she met Sydney. They had fallen in love at first sight. He proposed to her six months after they met. They were already engaged when Sydney began officer's training at Leon Springs. They soon learned that they would have precious little time together while he learned to fly at Kelly Field. They decided to wait until after the war was over to get married. Sydney's emotional distress over his separation from Lottie was evident in his last letter to her. I love to write to you, sweetheart, because I can forget for a while the war and the army and the major and can think about my dear little girl whom they are keeping me from seeing. Well, never mind, honey. Someday in the distant future, maybe it will take more than armies and wars and generals to separate us. Sidney's emotional state was further compounded by the Army having lost his original military service application. He learned about this only a few days before his solo flight at Kelly Field. Because his records were lost, Sidney was forced to retake a rigorous physical examination required of Army aviators. He also had to again submit to an immunization shot. He was administered a typhoid vaccine during the morning of the day of his solo flight. Friends and fellow flying cadets observed that Sidney was stressed out over having had to retake the flight physical and his separation from his fiancée. Sidney had conveyed to his childhood friend Stuart McManus, the Menger Hotel's night manager, that he felt he would not solo successfully. On Tuesday, November 13, 1917, Sidney Brooks climbed into a Curtis JN-4A aircraft for his solo flight from Kelly Field. He had to successfully complete the 40-mile cross-country flight from Kelly Field to Hondo, Texas and back to earn his wings and commission. Brooks and the other cadets flying solo that day made it safely to Hondo, landing there and then taking off again. However, on the last leg of the flight back to Kelly Field, something went wrong. Approaching Kelly Field at an altitude of 2,000 feet, Brooks's plane turned nose down in a moderate dive and crashed at the edge of the field. He was killed instantly. At the moment of impact, around 5 p.m., Lottie Jean Steele was painting in the backyard of her Terrell Hills home. Unaware of what had happened to her fiancé, she later reported having heard Sidney's voice call out to her twice at the precise moment he was killed. The death of her soulmate haunted her for the rest of her life. Sidney Brooks had become the first San Antonian to die in an aviation-related accident during World War I. As a consequence, his was the largest military funeral in the city up to that time. His death had a profound impact on many people. My grandmother's father was Judge Howard Templeton, and Judge Templeton was a, a law partner of Sidney Brooks's father. Uh, so the family saw each other socially, my grandmother was the same age as, as Sidney Brooks. And uh, when we would come by Brooks, as she would often say, uh, she says, oh, she, she always uh, had an emotional affect to her when she talked about Sidney Brooks. I think she liked it. And she said he was a really sweet boy. He was a really nice boy. 
and that their families were really broken up when, of course, when he died. She went to the funeral and she said it was the absolute largest funeral that San Antonio had ever seen at that time. Less than a month after Sidney Brooks' death, his name was honored with a memorial that has lasted nearly a century. On December 5, 1917, Colonel Henry Hap Arnold, serving in the authority of the Acting Chief Signal Officer for the Army, sent the following letter to the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Reply to your letter of November 23rd to General George C. Squire relative to naming the new aviation field at San Antonio Brooks Field. You are informed that this office is only glad to comply with your request. And the new aviation field located near San Antonio will be known hereafter as the Sigma Corps Aviation School, Brooks Field, San Antonio, Texas. Seventy-five years after Brooks Field was established, Sidney Brooks came home to his final resting place. His descendants had agreed to an Air Force request to disinter him from a local cemetery and rebury him behind the Brooks Memorial at Brooks Air Force Base. He rests in peace at a place where Air Force scientists advanced the science of aviation medicine that dramatically improved the survivability of America's military aviators. When Rudolf Keilman established an Indian trading post on property that would later become Brooks Field, he had no idea that his investment would yield a small fortune due to the great war that raged in Europe. The Army Air Service had known for some time the favorable year-round flying conditions that prevailed in San Antonio. The Army found in the mesquite-choked, rattlesnake-infested land that Keilman owned the ideal site for a new flying field. The San Antonio Chamber of Commerce took the initiative in 1917 to attract the Army to San Antonio's south side by paying Rudolph Keilman $150 an acre. They purchased from him an initial 873 acres, which they leased to the Army. The Army eventually acquired the property and bought more land from Keilman to expand the base. The site for the new flying base was initially known as Kelly Field No. 5, when work began on December 8, 1917. Thomas Harmon and Company of St. Louis was contracted to build the field. The $1.5 million contract included the construction of 65 buildings. Among them were administration offices, six barracks, six mess halls, 12 wooden aircraft hangars, and four auxiliary hangars. Noted Detroit architect Albert Kahn deviated from the era's typical flight line linear patterns by designing Brooks Field's distinctive crescent-shaped row of aircraft hangars. The curved hangar line faced an open field with base support facilities arranged to the north behind the flight line. An army of 3,000 men were hired to build Brooks Field. Among them were Coloma Jackson's father and uncle, Thomas and Perry Luker. They heard that um, they were hiring men to work at Brooks Air Force, building a new, new one. They were going to call it Brooks. They went up there in, in the latter part of 1917 to um, work but there was no buildings there for them to stay in. They managed to get a tent somehow or other, but the tent didn't have any floor in it. And my uncle, so I heard from daddy, that he had a new pair of shoes and he didn't enjoy wearing them, they hurt his feet. So when he got up in the morning, he didn't put his shoes on it until he just had to, so he walked around on the cold ground 
barefoot, and um, as a result, he finally took pneumonia d just about the time they were finishing Brooks Field that he, he passed away. I believe went maybe seven. February 1918 was probably the um, uh, about the time that he'd passed away, just before they were ready to open Brooks Field. Brooks Field was completed in February 1918. Flight operations began the following month, signaling the dawn of a new era in American military aviation. Renamed Brooks Field, the base earned another moniker, Gosport Field, the unofficial nickname for the system of flying instruction conducted there. From March 1918 to May 1919, the British developed Gosport method for airborne voice communications was used to train Army flying officers as flight instructors. Brooksfield's legacy as a place for aviation and aerospace innovation and development began when it was selected as the first Army flying base in the United States to test the Gosport method. This method resolved the main in-flight communications problem aviators experienced during the era of open cockpit aircraft, engine noise, and aerodynamic pressure. Known as the all-through system for matching instructor with pilot throughout the primary flight training, Gosport featured airplanes fitted with dual controls and speaking tubes. Brooks Field instructors refined Gosport into a system that helped reduce training accidents and increased pilot survival rates. As a result, Gosport was made mandatory at all Army flying fields. Gosport system modifications were a harbinger of things to come at Brooks Field, where aviation technological experimentation later played a major role in enhanced aviator performance and survival. Pilot survival, however, appeared to be an afterthought during the fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants post-World War I era. Many years before the base became a center for human performance and aviation safety research, Brooksfield was known for its freedom of the skies culture perpetrated by risky flying experimentation. I never hoped before for such freedom in the way of cross-country trips and stunt flying. The encouragement to master difficult problems in the air and to think up new stunts and combinations of stunts which prevail here means more to a flyer than anything else could possibly mean. Lieutenant A.T. Clark, Brooksfield, 1918. Stunt flying ruled the skies over Brooksfield as young men in their flying machines took liberties with life, limb, and any obstruction that got in their way. Compounding the problem were early flight rules that young pilots sometimes followed. If you see another machine near you, get out of the way. Do not trust altitude instruments. Learn to gauge altitude, especially when landing. Don't attempt to force machines onto the ground with more than flying speed. The result is bouncing and ricocheting. Captain John McCready, officer in charge of flying, Brooks Field. Freedom of the Skies took a backseat to the financial freedom that a local entrepreneur enjoyed through a legendary business that was inseparably linked to Brooksfield history. Known to the underbelly of society as Wild Bill Kyleman, 
The former San Antonio cop was the son of Brooksfield's original property owner, Rudolph Kyleman. Quick-fisted and ill-tempered, the six-foot-three-inch, 200-pound saloon owner persuaded his father to give him two acres in Berg's Mill, next to Brooksfield. The entrance to Brooksfield then was at Berg's Mill on Old Corpus Christi Highway, which was called the South Loop. Rudy Kyleman, Wild Bill's son. Wild Bill Kyleman saw an opportunity to profit from his association with the Army as the proprietor of a business that catered to Brooksfield Airmen. He built across from Brooksfield a huge dance hall and saloon. Torn down after World War I and rebuilt as the Horn Palace, the showplace eventually became the Brooksfield Officers Club. <laughs> 